Good stuff. Well, please, if you have a Bible, turn to Luke chapter 2. It's on page 1081 if we're using the church Bibles. Luke chapter 2. And begin at verse uh, 41. We don't know a lot about the uh, sort of the childhood life of Christ, but we, uh, because the Bible doesn't need to tell us that, God didn't want us to know that. We don't need to know that in many ways. Um, But we do get a little insight about uh, Jesus as a child uh, here in Luke chapter 2 and verse 41 onwards. Let me read this to you and then we'll think about some things in this new series. Every year his parents went to Jerusalem for the feast of the Passover. When he was 12 years old they went up to the feast according to the custom. After the feast was over, while his parents were returning home, the boy Jesus stayed behind in Jerusalem, but they were unaware of it. Thinking he was in their company, they travelled on for a day. Then they began looking for him among their relatives and friends. When they did not find him, they went back to Jerusalem to look for him. After three days, they found him in the temple courts, sitting among the teachers, listening to them and asking them questions. Everyone who heard him was amazed at his understanding and his answers. When his parents saw him, they were astonished. His mother said to him, Son, why have you treated us like this? Your father and I have have been anxiously searching for you. Why were you searching for me, he asked. Didn't you know I had to be in my father's house? But they did not understand what he was saying to them. Then he went down to Nazareth with them and was obedient to them. But his mother treasured treasured all these things in her heart. And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favour with God and men. Wow. Please do pull out your message outline if you've not done so yet, as uh, we start this new series of messages uh, called Gravity. And what we're going to do over the next four weeks is we're going to talk about, we're going to think about how we find balance in our relationship with God, but also how do we find order and balance in our daily lives. The only way that the only way that you will find completeness and purpose and balance in life is by following Jesus Christ. Jesus should be, he must be, he has to be the strongest force in our lives, our most extreme importance and priority. And I want to begin this series by talking about how to balance your personal life. Because you see, all of us believe in God at some level, and yet why is there such almost seems to be like a polar difference between, uh, in, in the Christian experience. Why do sometimes we get so many different extremes? And I suggest it really comes down to order, because order in our life, in our Christian life, is important. Order is everything in many ways. In other words, the way that we prioritise our world and our lives, it creates and it impacts the lives that we experience. Let me give you an example. Those of you who are married, um, you, you, will, um, you will know that order is important if you're married. Um, for example, let's just talk about something really simple this morning. Let's talk about loading the dishwasher. Now, maybe this is just me, I don't know, maybe this is my thing, but uh, there are those of you that when it is your turn to load the dishwasher, you will just grab the things out of the sink or wherever, and, and you'll just grab whatever, and you'll just put it anywhere you like in the dishwasher. Already I'm getting stressed, okay? All right. Some of you, you put cups on the bottom. I mean, I'm talking about small cups, okay? They don't go on the bottom. It's pans, isn't it? It's big things on the bottom, cups on the top, big things on the bottom, okay? Some of you, you just, you know, it's just wrong. It really is. And um, I believe that God just simply tolerates you, really, if you're doing that with the, the dishwasher, because there is an order to things. You know, you stack it nice. All right, maybe it's just me. Um, Let's talk about something else. What about food shopping? So some of you, when you go shoot food shopping, you have no list at all, okay? In fact, what do you do? You walk every aisle and often you go shopping when you're really hungry, which is a bad thing to do, isn't it? Because you're putting things in the trolley that really, you don't really need that sort of stuff. You know, you, you, it, there are things you want in your stomach more than you want in need in your trolley, I think, at that point. It's a really bad approach to shopping. But there are others of you, and I just think, honestly, I think it's a little bit of a sickness, okay? 
but you almost have like the blueprints to the supermarket on your phone or wherever, and you have a shopping list and you've categorised what aisle you're going to go down, how long it will take you to spend in that aisle and what you're going to do and all that sort of stuff. And you are so, I mean, I, it's a sickness, I think. I think you need help. But you're so, you know, it's, it's, it's all about how I want to order my shopping trip to get it right. Well, there is an order to things and order matters. And I think... I would say a life that God blesses is a life not just empowered by the Holy Spirit, but it's the type of life that we offer, but also it's the type of order that we offer it to God. A life that God moves through, a life that God blesses, is not so much about the things in the life where we say, um, okay God, I'm going to give you just this part of my life here and this other part of my life there, um, but it's when we say, Lord, I'm going to offer it to you in this order that pleases you. Because here is the truth. God must be first in your life. And when God is first in every area of your life, then your rest of your life will be filled with order. It will be in balance. Because if God isn't first in any area of your life, whatever that might be, I would argue that your life will be full of disorder. It will be out of balance. Because balance and order matter. Look, look what Jesus said in Matthew 6, verse 33. But seek first his kingdom and his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Notice the, 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 the order of that, that we are to seek God first, and then these things will be added to you. These things will be given to you. Then you will receive what God wants to give you. Then you receive a sense of order and balance. And I think when you do that, your personal life will come into order and balance. You see... All of the world is based on this principle of balance anyway. The principle of nature is this, is that our planet is perfectly balanced. It, it is tilted at a certain angle and it rotates at a certain miles per hour without any vibration. You see, if the planet was, our planet was just a little bit uh, closer to the sun, we would burn up. And if it was a few miles further away from the sun, we would freeze to death. The world is in balance. In nature, the ecologists study the ecosystems where there is the food chain and, and the checks and the balances that, that take care of each other. In architecture, there's balance. There has to be balance uh, between structure. Engineers know that, that if a building isn't built right and the stress isn't balanced, it, the, the building will collapse or the bridge will fall through. In your body, doctors say when you get sick, it's an imbalance in your body. Health comes when your body is restored back to balance. All through your life, in everything we look at, it all focuses towards this principle of balance. And therefore God wants our personal lives to be balanced in order. Proverbs 28 verse 2 says, A man of understanding and knowledge maintains order. He has balance in his life. Uh, 1 Corinthians 14 33 says, for God is not a God of disorder, but of peace. God wants things to be in balance and in order. God wants us to live a balanced lives. But there is a problem. And it's a problem that I often see when I chat with people, when I counsel people. Probably the most common problem I encounter is the problem of imbalance. Imbalance it is a disease that has many different symptoms, but the root is the same. And you can be imbalanced at anything. Sleeping, yes. Eating, yes. Work, yes. Recreation, yes. Everything. You can be imbalanced in the way in which you use your time. And the problem is that most of us, we will work on our public lives. And then what we do is we, we let the private life, our private lives, slide. We work on how we look and how we smile and how we talk and what we look like to everybody else, and particularly in church, we're pretty good at wearing that sort of church face. But we don't let people see our private life. And we sometimes allow that just to slide and not develop it. A lot of people's lives are like poor photographs. They're overexposed and undeveloped. In fact, a lot of our lives are overexposed. Everybody sees us and knows us and we have contact with a lot of people, but where our private lives are underdeveloped. And therefore, that will cause problems in our lives if we're not careful. Two things will happen. The first is this. First is frustration. That's the first thing that we will experience when our life is out of balance. 
I don't know about you, but um, when I was a kid, I used to watch them. You see it occasionally now, but they used to be all the things. Remember all those variety TV shows where you had these guys that would have these, these poles and they'd be spinning the plates on those poles, you know that sort of thing? Uh, so what they do, they have a guy with a long skinny pole and what they would do is they'd get a plate, they'd have these stack of plates and what he would do is he starts sort of twirling the pole and he'd put a plate on there and balance it and spin it around and he'd spin that pole and then he'd do the next one and then the next one and then you get to sort of, I don't know, number nine and the first one would start to wobble as if he'd fall off and so he had to leave that one and rush to that. I don't know about you, but when I watched it, I got very stressed because it's, a, you know, but you, you know the sort of thing. Isn't that a frustrating thing though? I know it's part of an act, but you know, how frustrating that is. He's got one going and he's got to get back to the next one. He's got to keep an eye on it and it's just frustrating. And a lot of people live their lives like that today. We use that phrase, don't we? Oh, I've got to keep the plate spinning. And we live our lives like that. We go from this, that, and to this, and we do a little bit over here, and then we do a little bit over there, and then we stop that, and we work on that area of our life a little bit, and then it's another, and so on. And it becomes very, very frustrating. Because just about the time you get one thing in balance, the other one starts to fall off. Frustration is a result of imbalance in our personal lives. Secondly, fatigue. You get tired when your life is out of balance. Anybody who's brought a new set of tyres for their car, they will know that when you buy new tyres, you need to get them balanced, don't you? So if, if uh, the tyres on your car are not balanced, then you're either going to have a very bumpy ride, uh, and you feel it as you drive, um, there's going to be vibrations, the car doesn't handle so well, um, but, but it's also this as well, isn't it? If you don't get it right, then your tyre will wear out. You can end up with a bald spot on your tyre, uh, or it could blow out. And likewise in your life, in our human lives, when our lives are out of balance, we'll get rubbed the wrong way, and eventually we will blow out, or burn out, because of imbalance. Just like a tyre that is out of balance, that wears the wrong way, when your life isn't balanced correctly, you wear out much quicker, you get tired, you struggle. Now what does the Bible have to say? Does the Bible have anything to say about this sort of stuff? Well it does, it has a lot to say. The passage what you read earlier on is a fascinating account, as I said, about Jesus in his early life as a child, around about 12 years old. But there's a very interesting and a very telling verse right at the end of that passage. It's in Luke 2, verse 52, because we see the example of Jesus, Jesus who really was the most balanced person ever. Look what it says. And Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and in favour with God and men. Notice he grew in these areas. He grew in wisdom. That means he grew intellectually. He grew in stature. That means that he grew physically. He grew in favour with God. That means that he developed spiritually and he grew in favour with men. That means he developed socially. He was a perfect picture of a balanced life. Now what we're going to do over these next four weeks, we're going to look at five areas of our personal life that you need to keep in balance. And the reason I'm talking about this is because I just think at the beginning of a new year, um, it's just a great time to just stop and to do a little bit of evaluation of our lives. Where are we at? Is our life in balance, or are we, if we're really, really honest, we know that we're out of whack in some areas, and that we feel like we're, we're fighting fires all the time, and we feel like we're just almost trying to keep ourselves from going under. We almost have too many things going on in our lives. This could be the year where you get your act together. This could be the year where you get your life back into balance, where you, you get your life in shape and in order. And I'm not going to be talking about career or family life and things like that. I'm talking more about you, your own personal life. Because if that gets out of balance, it will affect anything around you, anybody around you. It affects all areas of your life. So this morning, I'm just going to give you a bit of an overview. And I'm going to talk about this morning about five areas of your personal life that you need to keep in balance. Here's the first one. We need to have, first of all, mental balance. Now, there's a lot of talk in our society about uh, mental wellness and things like that, and there's nothing wrong with that. And I think the reason why our society is talking about this a lot is because they've just suddenly realised that the Bible's been talking about this for ages. Or maybe they don't realise that, but the Bible's been talking about it for ages. And, and the reason we need to start here is because balance and order in our personal life won't happen until you get the renewing of your mind. 
No change takes place in your life until your thoughts begin to change. Look at Romans 12, verse 2. It says, Do not conform any longer to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by your willpower? No. By working real hard? No. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. What you think about affects your life and you therefore need mental balance. Every single action always begins with a thought and if you don't think it, you don't do it. Now that's both good and bad, isn't it? So, if it's a good thought, then, then that's good because you're going to do good. If it's a bad thought, then you're going to do bad. Our thought life is really important because our thoughts control our lives. Proverbs 4.23 says, be careful how you think, your life is shaped by your thoughts. And I think sometimes we just don't realise how important this is. The Bible says the power of your mind, the power of your thoughts, has tremendous ability to transform, to, to shape your life for either good or for bad. So for example, here's a bad example in one sense, if you... If you accepted the thought that when growing up somebody said to you, do you know what, you're worthless, you're no good, you're never going to amount to anything, I don't know, you're just taking up space. If you accepted that, whether it was right or wrong, that would have shaped your life. Proverbs 23, 7 says, as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. We need balance in our life. Sometimes we tell ourselves things that are just not true, about us. Now how, how do you have that balance then when it comes to the mental side of life? Well, you balance it by screening the things that come into your mind. In other words, you don't just allow anything into your mind to come into your thought life indiscriminately. You maintain balance by choosing what you are going to think about. Now we all know the importance of nutrition, good food and good calories cause you to be healthier, to have more energy, bad calories, you know, junk food, things that don't do good can harm your body. The same is true in your thought life. In other words, what I must do is I need to feed my mind, not with junk, and there's plenty of junk you can feed your mind with. No, and there's plenty of poison you can feed your mind with as well, by the way. No, instead we need to feed our mind with truth. Jesus said it like this in John 8 verse 32. You will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. You need the best information to live the life that God wants you to live. And the information here is found right here in the Word of God, isn't it? It's called the truth. Matthew 4, 4 says, people need more than bread for their life, they must feed on every word of God. In other words, the Bible is food for our soul. And the danger is, is that we spend so much time filling our minds with other stuff and not enough Bible. Because the Bible is the owner's manual for life. Now, when should I feed my mind? When should I feed my mind with truth? I would argue all of the time. Constantly keep topping it up, as it were, all throughout the day. Because if you're constantly thinking about truth, what will it do? It will renew your mind. It will change your mind. It will give you that sense of freedom in your lifestyle because you're living for the glory of God. Freedom, you see, comes by having the right kind of thoughts, having true thoughts, mental balance. Secondly, you need physical balance. Now, we also need physical balance. Now, let me just put it like this. You can be healthier now, right now, than you, could, than you are right now in many ways. In other words, we all could choose to be healthier. Now, I'm not going to say we all got to drop and do 10 press-ups or something like that. That'd be exciting, wouldn't it? But um, physical energy, as it were, things that can, we can do to increase our physical energy. So there are things that I can do that can lower my stress. There are things I can do to cause me to live in better health in my life. I can eat better. I can get more sleep. I can reduce the stress in my life. There are things that I can do, and that's totally in my control. Look at Psalm 119, verse 73. It says, uh, You made my body, Lord, now give me sense to heed your laws. There are things that we can do, that we can learn, that can make us 
feel better physically. In other words, improving the controllable reduces the impact of the uncontrollable in my life. Now, I realise that there are health issues, I realise there are uncontrollable things in our lives that we cannot control because of where we're at or health-related problems. I'm not downplaying that. But there are other things that we can change and control in our physical life. So, you know, for example, there are things you can't change. You're never going to be one inch taller even though you might try. You're never going to be as handsome as me. I know that's difficult for you to get your heads around, but you know, there are some things that you can't change, but there are some things you can change. You can have more energy than you've got. You could be in better shape, perhaps. You could extend your, your life simply just by living a better lifestyle. And that's in my control. So I don't know, maybe you need to go get a checkup. Maybe you need to go see a dentist. Maybe you need to think about vitamins and supplements and things like that. I, listen, I'm not an expert, but there are some things, there are some steps that you can take, that you can do, that are controllable, that will help you physically. And never downplay our body. The body that God has given to us is to be used for his glory. Look at 1 Corinthians 6, 19 to 20. It says, you do not belong to yourself, for God bought you with a higher price. So you must honour God with your body. Now my question is, do you do that? Do you glorify God with your body? We need physical balance, because if, when we don't take care of our bodies, it will affect everything else. You have to ask yourself, am I constantly complaining about being tired? You know, are you so tired? Are you tired of being sick? Are you sick and tired of being sick and tired sort of thing? Well, there is a way that we can add more energy, and that is physical balance. Deal with the physical, because there are some things that you can't change. There are physical elements that we cannot change. I understand that. But there are other things that we could, perhaps. I can choose to get healthier. Do you do anything to your body? I don't mean worship your body, but do you care for your body? Or do you just ignore it? Physical balance. Getting your life in shape. Thirdly, we need to have spiritual balance. And that is part of your personal life. Now the fact is, the further away you get from God, the more trouble you're going to have in your life the more difficulties, the more stress, the more things that are going to go wrong because you are not cooperating with your Creator. You're not in tune with Him. You're not following God's plan for your life. The Bible says, you see, the way of the unrighteous is tough, it is rough, it's full of thorns, it's difficult, it is a rocky road. And the further I get away from God, the more I move away from God spiritually, the more trouble I'm going to have in my life. But on the other hand, the closer I get to God, the more I develop my relationship with God, the more my life will be transformed. The more my life is going to be living for his glory. 2 Peter 3.18 says, Grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. And notice there are two things, two ways you grow as a Christian here. You grow in grace and you grow in your knowledge of Jesus Christ. So therefore, you are to have intellectual growth. That means that you know more about the content of the Bible. You read the Bible, you study the Bible, you know the stuff of the Bible. But it isn't just that, because you also grow in grace. You see that? That means character. That means enjoying God. See, a lot of people grow in knowledge. They know about God. They know stuff in the Bible. They know the books of the Bible. Maybe they've even memorised verses. I mean, they know all about Nebuchadnezzar, for example. But they don't grow in grace. And they need to. You've got to have balance in your spiritual life. Now, one of the ways you can have balance in your spiritual life is to develop this regular habit of a spiritual checkup. Doctors will tell you every so often you need to go get a checkup, don't you, physically? Uh, because, you know, if there's something wrong in your body, you want to know sooner than later, don't you? The same is true of your spiritual life. That's one of the reasons I encourage you to buy this book, because it will give you this spiritual checkup. To just, on a regular basis, where am I, how am I doing? Where am I going spiritually? Have I grown as a Christian? And the Bible talks a lot about this. 2 Corinthians 13.5 says, Test yourself to make sure you're solid in the faith. Don't drift along taking everything for granted. Give yourself regular checkups. If you fail the test, do something about it. 
And in Psalm 139, verses 23 through 24, David says, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and know my thoughts. And see if there be any wicked way in me and lead me in the way everlasting. In other words, he's saying, God, where is my heart? Where am I? Am I growing? Am I in tune with you? In fact, the Bible says that before you take the Lord's Supper, you ought to pause and do a spiritual checkup every time you take the bread and the wine. 1 Corinthians 11:28, a man ought to examine himself before he eats of the bread and drinks of the cup. In other words, we need to confess any sin in our life, we need to have spiritual balance and to check up on ourselves. Now when I preach in a couple of weeks' time on spiritual balance, I'm going to, talk, I'm going to teach you eight habits that you can develop that I think will just change your spiritual life. It will help you grow. It will help you understand more. It will help you trust God more and become more that God wants you to be. Fourth, fourthly, you need emotional balance. Now again, many people don't realise this, but our ability to feel our emotions are a gift from God. Now they may not always seem like that, but even the negative ones in your life have a role in your life. Emotions are a great asset, they make you human. If you didn't have emotions, you'd just be like a robot, wouldn't you? You wouldn't be a human being. It, it is your emotional ability that allows you to love and to create and to be faithful and loyal and kind and generous and all of those sorts of things of emotions that, that are attached to the good things in life. However, our emotions can get out of balance. That's why it's important to have a personal life and to have that emotional balance. So Galatians 5, 22, 23, we have a picture of a perfectly emotionally balanced perf person. It says this, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Those nine qualities are the qualities of emotional stability. Because you see, when you're emotionally stable, you're not blown away by a crisis. In fact, those fruits of the Spirit are a picture of Jesus, aren't they? Because Jesus was all of that. He was love, joy, peace, patience and so on. All those things wrapped up into one. So let me ask you, are you an emotionally balanced person? Do you have a tendency to worry often? Constantly? Are you a moody person? Do you let your moods go up and down? People don't know how you're going to be from day after day. Are you mastered by your moods rather than managing your moods? Do you get depressed? Do you get fed up very quickly over things? You see, God cannot be God in my life if emotions are the God of my life. God can't rule my life if my emotions rule my life. And we can sometimes do that and allow that. If I make decisions simply based on how I feel about them, then I've made my feelings God. And then God can't be God. So Romans 8, 6 to 8 says, to be controlled by human nature results in death, to be controlled by the Spirit results in life and peace. Those who obey their human nature cannot please God. You can't please God if you allow your human nature and emotions are part of that, if you allow them to dominate your life, to run your life, that you make decisions based on how do I feel about this rather than what does God say about this. You therefore need emotional balance. And I think emotional balance is a combination of confidence and contentment. You're confident and you're contented and you therefore then are emotionally stable in your life. And fifthly, you need social balance. And I'm talking here about relationships. You know, you can have everything going right in your life, uh, but if your relationships are lousy, life stinks, doesn't it? You know, you could be a millionaire, for example, and you could be popular, you could be well-known and successful, but if you've got people that you're at odds with, life is tough. So you need social balance in your life. So Romans 12, 16 says this, live in harmony with one another. And that word balance in the dictionary, interestingly, one of the different, uh, different uh, sort of definitions is, is when all parts are in harmony. That's a good way of saying balance. So when our relationships, all our relationships are in harmony, there is social balance. Verse 18, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everybody. 
as far as it depends on you. In other words, the responsibility is on you to live at peace with everybody. Now, some people may not want to play ball with you, that's their responsibility, but your responsibility is to live at peace with everybody. Therefore, that's social balance. The fact is, you and I, we can choose to deepen our relationships. That is an intentional choice to make my relationships better. I can learn some communication skills. I can uh, build some new healthy relationships. I I can replace the unhealthy relationships in my life. I can work on my relationships. In fact, I can risk connecting because because connection is always going to be a risk. And if I want to make decent relationships with people, I have to take that risk of connection. 1 Corinthians 14, 1 says, let love be your highest goal. And that ought to be your goal for the rest of your life. Life is all about learning how to love. There are billions of people in this world who are dying for your love. They are all around you. They may even be sitting in the row where you're sitting here this morning. And by the way, where do you learn the connection techniques? Do you know the best place to learn them? It's in church. But you can't love in a crowd. One of the Major ways you can learn love in church life is to get in a small group. It's to be part of a small group of people where you can do life together and encourage each other and build relationships and new connections that will strengthen you in your walk with Christ. And if you're not in a small group, what a great time at the beginning of a new year to ask to join a small group. You can deepen relationships with people when you're part of a small group. You therefore need social balance. Now, I can't impress on you enough how important balance is in life. Balance living, balance in your personal life. How do you get started then? We'll talk about specifics in the next few weeks, but there are three suggestions from the Word of God about how you can get started in this whole area. Proverbs 14.8 says, The wisdom of the prudent is to give thought to their ways, but the folly of fools is deception. Wise people think about where they are going. They give thoughts to their ways. They consider their life. They consider where they're going. Fools, on the other hand, deceive themselves. They think everything's going fine and they've never pressed pause and had a look at where they are at. Proverbs 14, 15 says, A simple man believes anything, but a prudent man gives thought to his steps. How do you get started in balancing your life? Let me give you three steps to consider. First of all, step one, Take an inventory. That's what I've been saying, really. Stop and look at your life and say, well, where am I in balance and where am I out of balance in my life? Look at yourself, evaluate, do a self-examination. I mean, don't do a lot of navel-gazing. I mean, don't spend too much on it, but certainly enough to actually have a proper look. Have a spiritual, mental, emotional checkup and evaluate your lifestyle. Proverbs is saying it's just wise to do that. It makes sense to analyse. Socrates says the unexamined life is not worth living. Well, how do you avoid that? How do you avoid coming to the end of your life and saying, oh man, if only, do it by stopping in the middle of life and just analysing it, looking at it, evaluate it and saying, where am I out of balance? What's missing in my life? Do you remember the story of the prodigal son in Luke 15? It's a great story. The story is the prodigal son went out and he spent all of his money, he had a good time with wine, women and song, but he ran out of his inheritance and he ends up living in a pig style, eating pig, eating pig food, which for a Jewish boy was a big no-no. In Luke 15, 17, there's a turning point in his life and there's a fascinating verse and it just simply says this, he says, he came to his senses. In other words, he just realised, what on earth am I doing? He came to his senses. He said, what am I doing here? I'm going to go home. Have you come to your senses? Have you said to yourself, I'm not going to waste the rest of my life. I'm going to make it count. I want to get my life in balance. Maybe this is the year for you to get some things in balance that you know are out of whack. Maybe that's socially or mentally or physically or spiritually or emotionally, I I don't know. But I want to encourage you this week, do some homework. Stop, have a look, go through the outline and think about these five areas. 
ask yourself mental balance. Am I, am I mentally sharper than I was five years ago? If not, well, why not? What, what will I do about that? See, I would argue that a lot of Christians are mentally flabby in their life. You know, you go home, you switch on the TV and you put your mind in neutral and that's it for the rest of the day. When's the last time you sat down and read a good Christian book that challenged you mentally, that stretched you to consider some big theological, theological truths? When's the last time you thought, I'm going to develop my mind theologically? How about physical balance? Am I always complaining of a lack of energy and, and, and I'm always fatigued and I, po I pay no attention really to what I eat or how I exercise or how much sleep I get. I disregard my physical condition totally. Am I going to do anything about it? Am I a workaholic? Do I take time off? Where am I physically? How about spiritual balance? How are you growing as a Christian? It, when I have a problem, is my first reaction to panic or do I, is my first reaction to pray? Or do I often see that as the last result because all the other stuff didn't work very well? Do I actually intentionally take time for God? Do I trust him? Do I really know him? Do I spend time reading the Bible on a regular basis? Am I choosing to grow spiritually or am I a bit haphazard about it? What about your emotional balance? Ask yourself the question, do I worry a lot? Am I a really moody person? You might want to ask the person if you're married, married to, they might tell you. Uh, do, I, do I get mastered by my moods? Do I lose my temper at the slightest little thing? Am I irritable all the time? Do I get fed up? Do I get sad? Do I get upset? Do I get depressed easily? What about social balance? Who can I count on as a genuine friend? Who can count on me as a genuine friend? See, if you're really serious about getting life in balance this year, I encourage you, stop and evaluate. In fact, go further than that. Why don't you ask your spouse or a close friend to evaluate you? Now we're getting really serious, aren't we? Maybe I've gone over the, po over the level now. Because the fact is, we all have blind spots, don't we? You might think, well, yeah, Phil, actually my life is really in balance. And you talk to your wife, your husband, they go, <laughs> no, you're not. What about this area? And you go, yeah, yeah, but that doesn't count. And they go, oh, yes, it does. Or a close friend. There is, the Bible says there is safety and wisdom in the multitude of counsellors. So, so when in doubt, ask someone. Say to someone, tell me, where am I out of balance? Where do I need to, what area of my life do I need to work on? Ask them how you're doing in one of those five areas, perhaps. Get a second opinion. Step two write down a plan of action. Now we plan most and um, pretty much every area of our life, don't we? Except our personal life. Balance does not come by accident. It doesn't just happen. You have to work at it and that's tough sometimes. It's just, it isn't automatic. You have to plan and set goals and say specifically what you're going to do. Ephesians 5, 15 and 16 says, be very careful then how you live, not as unwise but as wise. In other words, don't be foolish in the way in which you live your life, the way in which you use your time. Be careful, analyse it. Notice this, making the most of every opportunity. How do you make the most of every opportunity? By planning for it. By being prepared for it. Because when an opportunity comes, you're ready for it. You develop a plan of actions. So one of the things that makes for balance in your life are habits, getting into good habits, good spiritual habits, and I'll talk about some of these in the next couple of weeks. And the reason why habits are really important is because we're a creature of habits, aren't we? We like routine in our life. Even those of us who say, oh, no, 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 I just like to be spontaneous all the time. No, 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 you like routine. And how do you break bad habits and make good habits? Well, we'll talk about that. It's part of getting balance in our lives. But here's the thing. This ain't a self-help program. You can't do this on your own. Willpower is not enough in getting our life in balance. You need more. And therefore, probably the most important step is step three. Establish Christ at the centre of your life. Put Jesus right in the middle. 
Just like a wheel that has a hub, your life has to have something to centre on. You will always be out of balance until you get something, one thing that your life centres on. You can centre your life on money, but you will get out of balance. You can centre your life on, on retirement or recreation and you will be out of balance. In a wheel, all of the power comes from the point of the hub and then it's distributed out to the spokes that turn the wheel. Likewise, in life, when your hub of your life is Jesus Christ, when Christ is at the centre of your life, the power comes through him and it will go out to all the other areas of your life that will give your life balance. That's why Matthew 6.33 says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And in all of these other things, all the stuff we've talked about will come into focus, will come into balance. Now maybe you're thinking to yourself, well hang on a minute, I have a problem because my life is falling apart at the moment. My life is well out of balance. How do I put my life back together when it's falling apart? What holds it all together? What's the glue that can hold our lives together? Well, Colossians 1, 15 to 17 talks about Jesus. It says he is the image of the invisible God. In other words, we don't see God. That's why he sent Jesus to us so that we could see what God is like, so we could see him. He is the firstborn over all creation. For by him all things are created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things pull together. If your life is falling apart, it's because Jesus Christ is not at the centre. The one who, notice, holds things all together. Therefore, put him at the centre of your life and watch what he will do. He will put your life back together because Jesus is the one who not only holds all things in this world together, but he holds your life together. Now, there are numerous benefits of having a balanced life. You'll be more confident, you'll have more energy, you won't be sort of rushing around all over the place and running out of energy and all that sort of stuff. You'll enjoy life more. You will have a better spiritual life. You'll be more mentally alert. You'll be spiritually deep. You'll be more emotionally stable. You'll feel better about yourself and about life. And as I said, I think imbalance is one of the main problems I often see in people's lives. And it can show itself in many different ways in our lives. But it's the same root. The same issue is that Christ isn't at the centre but when Christ is, when he is the hub of the wheel of your life, as it were, then balance will spread out to the spokes in all the different parts of your life. And we'll look at how Jesus Christ makes a difference, but the starting point is putting him at the centre. And that's the bottom line, it really is. Jesus Christ wants to be the, at the centre of your life. And maybe for the very first time you can make him number one. Or maybe you've been pushing him to the sides for quite some time and you're honest with yourself right now that actually he's not at the centre. There are other things and there may be good things. There's nothing bad about those things except that they have just become your God. And Jesus needs to come back to the centre. Because when you do that, he will bring your life into balance. We're going to pray. And we're going to spend a few moments now just considering personally some of the areas that we've been talking about. Let's bow our heads as we pray. I want to encourage you to pray a prayer in a moment that you might ask, ask the Lord to be the centre of your life. Now, you may have done that 50 times before, maybe. Or maybe this is the very first time, I don't know, but that he might be the focal point of your life so that everything else will be brought into balance. Maybe your life is falling apart, I don't know. Maybe you just feel like life is just running away from you and you go from one thing to the next and you feel just constantly sort of, feel like you're going under. Then why don't you pray that the Lord might take the pieces of your life and bring them back together? Because we know the Bible tells us that he loves you, he wants to help you, he's waiting on you. I want to give you a moment now of quiet. A moment where you get before God and maybe one of those five areas you just need to ask God's help to bring into balance. 
Maybe there are all those areas that need to be put into balance. Maybe it's simply just making him center, center of your life, number one in your life. Whatever God has impressed upon your heart, bring it before him now quietly. Lord, I thank you that you can help us to live balanced lives. Thank you that the principles of balance are found all throughout your word. And yes, this year I pray that many of us will find a new renewal in our lives, becoming all that you want us to be, becoming balanced people. Lord, would you help us, we pray, in Jesus' name. Amen.